Hi everybody, uh, welcome back to the next presentation in our series of continuous delivery expert talks online. Today we've got Steve Smith joining us um, and Steve has been practicing and consulting on continuous delivery for years now. Uh, he's the author of the book Measuring Continuous Delivery and he's co-author of the book Build Quality In. You can find both of these uh, publications on leanpub.com. Um, I'm sure Steve will say a little bit more about them later. So welcome, Steve. Thank you. Um, Hello, everyone. Great. Hey, and uh, so just earlier, so earlier in the series, we had Dave Farley explaining the rationale for continuous delivery. Um, last week, Lindsay, who is here today, uh, Lindsay Pruer presented on how to smooth the continuous delivery path uh, with a set of tips to help teams adopt continuous delivery practices. Um, so this evening, Steve will take us through how to measure continuous delivery and to help organizations measure what, what's working, the value of that, and decide on what to fix or improve next. So I am super excited about this talk. Thank you, Steve. Really appreciate it. Uh, I will hand over to you now. Thanks, John. Hello, everyone. Thanks for um, joining. I hope everyone's happy and healthy and well um, during this lockdown. I think it's still called a lockdown. Um, uh, okay, so let's get started. Okay, so um, I've been a continuous delivery consultant with Equal Experts for about six and a half years now. Um, it's a great company to work for. Um, and uh, I wrote a book based on some of my experiences, um, partly on working with Equal Experts and also some real deep thinking about the theory behind continuous delivery. Um, so I have a couple of excellent bits of advice for you, um, and one of them is um, here, which I've given to many people within Equal Experts when they're thinking of writing a book. Um, so I spent, um, well, uh, so I spoke to Dave Farley and Chess Humble once upon a time and said, I've got this idea for a book. Um, I thought about an extension to continuous delivery um, and I've got this huge example set. I worked on this really large um, government project with Equal Experts, showed them all the data and they were like, yes, Steve, you should do a book. And I told my wife it would take me uh, six months of four nights a week and it ended up taking two years so if anyone out there is thinking of writing a book part-time the second best bit of advice in this talk is do not write a book part-time <laughs> uh, write a series of blog posts instead and your family will thank you for it um, yes this book is on lean pub um, it's a real deep dive into kind of the stuff I'm talking about today and the some of the examples behind it um, very flimsily disguised if you've ever worked with me or check me out online, then you'll know exactly which government project it was. <laughs> so um, what's continuous delivery? Um, so the way I describe it um, to companies is that it's about having the speed and stability of releases to satisfy product demand. And we know that's important because Dave and Jez wrote a whole book about it in 2010, talking about how um, speed's essential, you know, there's opportunity costs associated with not delivering software. And um, I definitely didn't invent continuous delivery, but I did invent discontinuous delivery, which was pretty easy. I just looked it up on antonyms.com. But um, for me, discontinuous delivery is when you simply don't have that speed, you don't have that stability. And what I find myself working on with Equal Expert is some really interesting engagements with clients where they are stuck in discontinuous delivery and maybe have been for many years. And what we're trying to do is to help them get over that hurdle and to actually successfully adopt continuous delivery. Now, the tough bit about that is that there's an awful lot to do, okay? There's a lot of technology changes and there's a lot of organizational changes that might well be involved. So here's a whole bunch of technology changes that you might want to consider. Um, let's pick one out. Uh, what should we do today? Database migrations is always a good one. So I'm sure we've all worked in companies where database migrations are done manually by a database administrator who is not some kind of evil person. They are essentially doing heroic work, vital work that is time consuming and occasionally goes wrong through no fault of their own. If you can automate database migrations, if you can roll forward, roll backwards seamlessly, that puts you in a really strong position in terms of deployment time and also deployment rework. But there's a cost to doing that work. And there's also some risks associated with it. You know, it, it could go wrong. Um, I'm sure we can all remember times where database migrations were automated and didn't quite go as planned. <laughs> so there's a value cost risk associated with each of these practices out of continuous delivery. And it's also complicated by the smorgasbord of tools that are available to us 
And the um, best bit of advice I can give to you in this, um, after Don't Write a Book Part-Time, <laughs> is it really doesn't matter which tools you use. Okay, it never has, it never will. Um, I've done continuous delivery with Java, with a bash pipeline, which I'm not going to repeat. <laughs> uh, what am I doing now? GKE, um, done it with EKS before, you could probably do it with AKS. Any trendy tool, any old school tool, continuous delivery will work with those tools. You just have to avoid WebSphere, okay? That's the number one tip. <laughs> Don't try to do stuff with WebSphere. Um, any other tool, absolutely fine. Uh, organizational changes are more difficult, um, they're more risky, but they do have more value behind them. Each of these changes are going to deliver you know, some real tangible benefits to your organization. Uh, everybody doing on call um, is an easy one to pick out here. I've spent the last um, three, six months working with a really big client on getting Build It, Run It, Build It, Run It working across 30 different teams. And that throws up all kinds of interesting challenges in terms of the organization, not in terms of the technology, getting remuneration rights sorted, getting billing sorted, sort out an on-call forecast that can be working at scale. You know, these are significant problems to solve that organizations might be quite uncomfortable with. Now, as challenging as each of these organizational changes is and the technology changes, this isn't what makes continuous delivery so hard. Okay. What makes continuous delivery so hard is applying these changes to your organization. Okay? Your organization is a complex, adaptive system in which each individual has a partial amount of information in which cause and effect can only be understood in retrospect. This is why continuous delivery is different with every company. This is why sometimes it needs a huge amount of change and sometimes it doesn't need quite as many. Um, this is why I don't have a deployment pipeline startup and refuse to because that's not where the problems are. Okay, it's about how you fit these kind of changes into what your organization actually needs. So bearing this in mind, that gives us the obvious question of how do we actually try to move from discontinuous delivery to continuous delivery? And the way we do that is with the improvement carter, which you might have heard of. Um, it comes from a guy called Mike Rover, who studied um, Toyota for many years. The improvement carter is a continuous improvement framework. It creates a regular cycle of iterative, incremental improvements around your existing ways of working. So it's not about blowing up your organization's ways of working and starting all over again. It's about taking what you already have and just putting in, right, in place the right structures to iterate and to run experiments and to continue to learn. So essentially, you repeatedly go through the same cycle of four steps. First of all, you understand your direction, you lay out a vision of success, you do that to create some urgency, to inspire people. Then you grasp your current condition. You analyze the available data, um, quantitative data, numbers, qualitative data, stories, and you do that to understand where you currently are, how far you have to go to reach um, your vision of success. Then you establish a target condition. So that's about creating a milestone on your journey. You know, you're starting somewhere, you know where you need to go, you don't quite know how you're gonna get there. So you just take off in smaller chunks. You attach to that some success criteria, you attach to it a time horizon. And then in step four, you iterate towards that target condition. You run a whole bunch of experiments in parallel using the Deming cycle, which is plan, do, check, act. Um, uh, John mentioned that Dave Farley did a previous talk with Equal Experts about the rationale for continuous delivery. Um, Dave's a good friend of mine, quite confident he mentioned the scientific method at some point. Uh, he's a, a massive fan of it. The Deming cycle is really the um, scientific method in action, right? You um, have a hypothesis, you do some work, you see if your hypothesis was proven or disproven. If it was successful, then you incorporate that change into your normal ways of working. If not, you chuck it away and you try something else, okay? This is the best way we have to adopt continuous delivery in small chunks, iterating, regular cycles, learning as you go. Now the question becomes, how do we know if it's working? How do we know what our current condition is? How do we know what a target condition should be? And how do we know if, if an experiment has been successful? When should it stop? And the way we can do that um, is to measure the stability and speed of our release process. Now, the good news about this is that all the hard work has been done for us. All of the data collection, all of the analysis um, is done. 
that's because um, an amazing person, Dr. Nicole Forsgren and Jess Humble, who's all right, kind of amazing too, <laughs> um, and some co authors have over the years done the State of DevOps reports, which you might be familiar with. That's an annual survey of thousands of IT practitioners where they've looked at what does it mean to have high performance IT and what does that mean for organizational outcomes. They've also done some peer reviewed academic research and they published a book called Accelerate, which was out in 2018 and is my favorite book in many a moon. What Dr. Forsgren, Jez and others have found is that higher throughput and higher stability are possible together at scale. So you may have been told by some big scary IT firms in the past uh, that you have to choose between speed and stability and your organizations may have been set up in that way with a dev silo that's trying to do speed and an ops silo that's trying to do stability. What Dr. Forsgren and Jez and others have conclusively shown is that that is a lie. It's not necessary. You can have it all. It's not a zero sum game. Okay. You can have speed and stability together. They've also found all kinds of interesting things. For example, that continuous delivery is strongly correlated with organizational performance and organizations that deploy frequently to production are twice as likely to exceed market share, profitability and productivity expectations. Now, why do we care about this? It's because Dr. Forsgren and friends have used the same measures of continuous delivery throughout. They've defined stability as change failure rate and failure recovery time. That's the uh, time it takes to um, recover from a change and also um, percentage of changes that go wrong. And they've defined throughput as lead time and frequency. That's the time to make a change and the frequency in which you make your changes. Uh, so there's a book called um, How to Measure Anything by a guy called Douglas Hubbard, a very bold title. Uh, and in it, he talks about using clarification chains to make something that's intangible, tangible. So something like throughput is an intangible. But if you look at lead time and frequency together, you actually then have a definition of throughput that could be measured and better understood by people. We can take these measures and turn them into metrics. Um, a measure is a quantification of an event or an object at a point in time. If we measure them on a regular basis over a period of time, then we turn them into metrics. We can understand trends. We can see how stability and throughput rise and fall over time for a team. And by doing that, we increase the information value of our measurements. And that helps us to make better decisions over what experiments we should try next with continuous delivery. And also it gives us a better understanding of where we currently are. If we take those metrics um, for change failure rate and failure recovery time or lead time and frequency, and we measure them at the same rate at the same times and use the same visualizations, we can create what I call indicators, which are essentially um, a visualization that will show emergent uh, trends, interactions in a problem domain. So uh, back in uh, 2015, I think it was, um, I kind of had the idea of applying these measures to production deployments. My idea was that we would look at deployment failure rate and deployment failure recovery time together, and we would look at deployment lead time and deployment interval together. Now, it's really important to look at these metrics together because one of them on their own can be quite misleading. You might have a deployment failure rate of 1%, let's say, but if your deployment failure recovery time is five days, then you have the potential to lose a lot of money. You, you know, you're just wait, waiting for trouble. Likewise, if your deployment lead time is one or two days, then that's super duper well done you. You're probably not doing as much end-to-end -end testing as I'm worried about. Um, but if your deployment interval is every two months, then you're incurring a lot of opportunity costs, right? You have the ability to deploy frequently, but you're not doing it. You know, you've built a Ferrari and you're just driving around in a muddy field. That's not a good idea. On top of that, we can look at um, averages of variation here. So uh, for failure recovery time, lead time, and interval, we can look at if these changes are consistent, predictable, or if, you know, if a change is just like a flash in the pan. You can do that with median and standard deviation, or you can use something else if you want to. You know, I'm not precious. Uh, you go nuts. So um, this is what a deployment stability indicator looks like. Um, in terms of a technology value stream. So this is a generic value stream. We've got people writing code into version control on a branch. Please don't do that um, 
uh, when I'm looking. Then it's merged to uh, mainline, where you should have put it in the first place. Then it goes up to your build server, which in pipeline speak is known as your commit stage. Then you've got a whole bunch of test environments that I haven't visualized here because you probably have too many of them. And then in production, you do a deployment. And if that deployment goes wrong, that increases your deployment failure rate and the time it takes you to put in a subsequent deployment to rectify that failure is known as your deployment failure recovery time. And you can do that with a median and standard deviation. Steve, right. sorry, can I yes, just can I drop in a sec? Can you just pop your mic down a smidge? Uh, so, so yeah, try that. that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, no worries. Thanks, John. Okay, so with um, deployment throughput, we're looking at the time between the successful publication of a release candidate and its consequent deployment to production. If a release candidate doesn't make it that far, it doesn't count. And your deployment interval is the time between your production deployments. Now, you might choose instead to define deployment lead time as the time from mainline commit to production deployment. That's what David just talked about in the original continuous delivery book. And if you want to do that, that's absolutely fine. I find that looking at build times as separate to the time to go through test environments can be really useful. You can uncover some really useful information that way. Okay, so, um, why am I so confident that I know stuff about this? It's because um, I work with equal experts for two and a half years on a major government project. Um, when I first joined, we had, I think, uh, 10 teams, I'm going to say. By the time I left, it was 60 teams. We were building digital services at scale. Uh, we got up to, in my time, around 100 digital services, 600 microservices. And I was an operations team lead. Um, the team was responsible for what we would know today as platform enablement. So we were responsible for helping teams to achieve continuous delivery and operability. And we also owned the build and deploy tool chain, which was kind of useful because it was a big part of what we were doing. All right, so this is what the uh, value stream looked like for this government department. Um, I had a hand in designing it, um, so not too many test environments, although still one too many. Uh, you would commit code to GitHub, um, and teams would probably be using GitHub Flow. I'll come back to that later on. Or they might be using trunk-based development, which is great. After that, there was a Jenkins build server where you'd be building your changes. Your release candidates would then go up to uh, a repository. And there was an optional integration testing environment if you had some contract testing, or if somebody was making you do end-to-end -end testing and I wasn't watching. And there was then a mandatory load testing environment, and then you do your production deployment. Um, automated functional tests, what we might know as acceptance tests, they would happen on the build server, and your exploratory testing would happen on your own developer or tester laptop. So when our team started, we really wanted to get a handle on how teams were faring with continuous delivery. And it was really hard because we didn't have a lot of information at hand, and we had so many teams, it was hard to know who to help first. You know, we could uh, help the team sat next to us in London, or we could travel to Wales and help a team in a different office. We could travel to the North of England and help a team there. And often, teams don't know that they need help when they actually do need help. By the time they realize it, it can often be too late. And that definitely happened with a couple of our teams. So what we wanted to do was to measure delivery, to measure stability, to get an understanding of where teams were at. Not least because there was no single constraint that was affecting teams, because Every team went through exactly the same technology value stream. Every team used exactly the same tool chain. Deployments were fully automated. There were minimal change approvals, and each team was cross-functional. You know, there were no handovers to an ops team or to a DBA team. So lots of the kind of constraints you might find in other organizations simply weren't present here. All right, so we started out by um, creating a vision of success. And when I say we, I mean I. I did something that I do not recommend. Um, I waited till the Friday lunchtime when most people were in Nando's and I wrote a page on Confluence saying, we will deploy um, with a failure rate of less than 5% and it will be recovered in less than a day and uh, we'll do it at least once a fortnight and we'll do it in under a week. Um, and then when people came back from lunch, I pretended I'd always been there and I waited for a telling off that never came. 
So please don't do that. Do a proper vision of success where you actually engage product and IT stakeholders and actually get a sense of what continuous delivery means to you. One of the catches with continuous delivery is that it has a dynamic success threshold. What continuous delivery means to you in terms of deployment frequency, in terms of deployment failure rate, it will vary between organizations, maybe even between teams in your organization. So these numbers might look aggressive or conservative to you, um, but for the organization that I was working in at the time, this was pretty, um, pretty aggressive for a majority of teams, I think I'd say. Okay, so, oh, I'm going too fast. I should talk about the technology because I always forget to because I'm um, quite disinterested in it and that's quite dangerous. Um, so uh, how did it all work? So deployments happened through um, a homegrown orchestrator. This was before the days of Kubernetes. Um, so what happened was when a deployment happened, when a Docker container was run in production, a snippet of JSON metadata was stored in a Mongo database. Uh, my team then wrote some Scala microservice to suck that data out, do some nice data transformations, do some calculations. And then that data was sent up as JSON to um, a Google charting engine that was then shown on an internal uh, website. And um, on that website, I thought quite hard about how to present the information to different teams. So on one page, you could never see deployment frequencies for two teams side by side. You could only ever see one team. <clears throat> and you saw stability and throughput next to each other on the same level. So it was quite clear that we were giving them like equal precedence. The whole idea was to show teams their own improvement rate to encourage them to think about how they could get better themselves without worrying about what other teams were up to. Um, the tech was all really straightforward. In my experience, the catch is always how you collect the data. And because we had a single automated um, deployment tool that everyone was using, because everybody used the same build server, everybody used GitHub, it was pretty straightforward to suck up the data that we needed. Okay, so when we started to look at the numbers that we had, um, there were some pretty major surprises. So of our 60 teams, we found that a handful of teams had an average deployment failure rate of 0%, which was awesome. And their average deployment failure recovery time was zero days. So in other words, they very rarely had failures. And when they did, um, they'd fix them really fast. A majority of teams, the vast majority, had uh, an average failure rate of 10% and a failure recovery time of five days. So it would take, what, one in 10 deployments at that time was going wrong. And it was up to a, you know, a week to get that resolved for a majority of teams. Not a great place to be. Um, and I should also say the teams that had the highest deployment failure rate, they were our first port of call for our um, platform enablement team. So at a glance, we knew we didn't have to worry about a particular group of teams that were doing just fine. We had to urgently go and help these other teams that didn't necessarily know that they had problems. All right, so this is what an example indicator looks like. Uh, this is a deployment stability indicator and it's for the Apples team. They were not called the Apples team. Uh, there is no um, government function to do with Apples that I'm aware of. Um, I deliberately chose fruits, poorly disguised these examples. So um, our x-axis here is our timeline. The um, left y-axis is our deployment failure rate as a percentage and that covers deployment failure rate, which is in blue. And our right y-axis is in um, the deployment failure recovery time, which is in days. Now, if anyone's um, watching along and you're um, colorblind, please either mention in the chat now or contact John afterwards or myself um, on Twitter, perhaps. Um, and I'll be happy to walk you through this information in a medium that's more accessible to you. That's not a problem at all. So uh, what did we have with the Apples team? Well, this was one of our highest performing teams for a long time, and I made the fatal mistake of telling them that, and they strutted around with big heads for far too long. Uh, but what this team achieved was quite remarkable. We want these lines to trend downwards, down towards continuous delivery to a lower failure rate, a lower failure recovery time. And this team accomplished that. We can see here that um, in a six month period, they went from a failure rate of 20% to 0%. And they went from a average deployment to failure recovery time of nine days to zero days. And interestingly, this was accompanied by a huge increase in production deployments as well. So this team was kind of our poster child for continuous delivery in this government department for quite some time. And interestingly, when we went to speak with this team, 
uh, we wanted to amplify their successes to understand what was different about our team and then cross pollinate those new ways of working into other teams. We didn't really find much except that um, uh, the team all really got along really well. They loved their product owner who was the, just this lovely guy, a uh, long time civil servant, just a great guy. And um, I guess, I mean, this all happened before Project Aristotle from Google and their study into psychological safety. I think in hindsight now, you'd say that team had a high level of safety. They did have one interesting thing though, um, in terms of tooling. Their Grafana dashboards and their Kibana dashboards were much better than the standard ones issued out of the platform teams. They had somebody on their team who'd got the monitoring bug pretty bad and had written some really fantastic dashboards. So in the coming weeks, we did an export of their dashboards into JSON, wrote a little Scala DSL around it, um, made that a repo um, accessible to all of our 60 teams, and then just automatically generated all these dashboards for our 600 microservices. And in a very short period of time, we saw a marked uptick in operability. We saw a marked uptick in terms of how many teams had a good grip on what normal versus abnormal conditions were for their service in production. We wouldn't have done that without this indicator because we wouldn't have known to go to the Apple's team to ask them specifically about deployment stability and about operability. It just wouldn't have occurred to us at the time. Okay, so in terms of deployment throughput, uh, this was um, uh, really surprising. So we had, um, uh, uh, again, a handful of teams where they were deploying to production every five days and it was taking them a day to do it. So you might recall our vision of success was for teams to deploy at least fortnightly in under a week. We had teams doing it weekly in under a day and some were going faster than that. So that's all great, that's really cool. Um, and the Apple's team was one of those teams, you know, stability and throughput were increasing together for that team. They were doing things the right way and at, and at a sustainable pace. But we had a majority of teams deploying every three weeks in um, around a fortnight, which wasn't where we wanted to be. And there were a lot of teams there that we could go and help out with that. One particular team had a deployment lead time of three months and a deployment interval of null, which I had never seen before. And after some thought, uh, I realized it meant that they had deployed once to production. It took them three months to go through two test environments, one of which was optional. <laughs> and then after they did it once, they decided they didn't want to do that again. Uh, perhaps they went on a long holiday, I, I don't recall, but that was um, really interesting, not at all expected. So um, this is um, an example through the indicator for the Bananas team. And there's a real cautionary tale here for me and for others. Um, so what we can see here is our left y-axis is days, and that covers your deployment lead time, so that's time to production in orange. And in green, it's your deployment interval. That's your time between deployments. And we can see here that this team was doing really well, and then they're sliding in the wrong direction, right? Between January and March, they're deploying to production once every three days or so. By June, it's happening every 14 days. So they've gone in the wrong direction, let's say. Now, it's very easy to look at this and to start um, um, projecting stories onto the data. There's something in one of them, Taleb's books, about uh, the ludic fallacy, like the, this foolish notion that you can extract qualitative data from quantitative data, that you can create a story out of numbers. I fell into that with this. I look at this, and the um, old past Steve looks at this and goes, they're doing too much end-to-end -to -end testing, or they're stuck on a cab call, or something's, something's wrong. So I went to visit this team um, out in provincial England, and I kind of sat down in this meter and waited for them. And I'd met them before. And when they came into the room, I very quickly realized how wrong I was about this team because the entire team were different. And I kind of said, who are you? And they said, "Never mind us, who are you? And I was like, I said the worst thing. I said like, I'm from London, I'm here to help you. And they were like, we don't need help. Uh, <laughs> and what had happened was the entire team had left the government to work at some trendy new music startup down the road that was going to take on Spotify with minimal funding. Um, you can imagine what happened to that startup six months later, I imagine. And um, there was a whole new team working on the banana service and they had to get to know each other, get to know the government department, get to know the platform, which was pretty complicated, get to know their service, which was pretty complicated in its own right. And in, in that kind of scenario, like maintaining a pace of one deploy every three days, that's just not possible. Like 14 days is pretty good, I think, in that scenario. 
So um, kind of sat with the team, listened to their problems, offered some help. And later on, I think they got back down to weekly deployments, which was a great achievement. But there's a great uh, point here, which is that uh, measuring continuous delivery um, doesn't tell you the stories that you need to hear. It tells you where to go and find the stories, okay? It tells us here we need to go and talk to bananas, but not what actually is happening with the bananas team. All right, there's more. So um, it occurred to me that uh, the same measures that Dr. Forsgren and friends have cooked up, um, they can be applied to builds and code as well as deployments. We can look at build failure rate and build failure recovery time to understand the stability of your builds. And we can look at build lead time and build interval to understand the throughput of your builds. Um, and that's obviously from uh, code being pushed to mainline to a release candidate being created. And that's gonna be a pretty good leading um, signal of if a team's gonna be able to do continuous delivery or not, if they're consistently and successfully pushing release candidates up to the candidate repository. All right, so a build stability indicator means looking at the percentage of um, jobs that run on your build server and are unable to publish a release candidate. And the build failure recovery time is the median and standard deviation in time it takes you to recover from that build failure. So pretty straightforward. And build lead time is the time between your mainline commit and your publication of your release candidate. And your build interval is the time between the publication of your release candidates. And for our um, success criteria here for build indicators, we were looking for a build failure rate of less than 1%, build failure recovery time to be less than an hour, build lead time to be less than an hour, and build interval to be less than 24 hours. So teams should be producing a release candidate at least once a day, and if it goes wrong, it should be fixed in under an hour. What we found was that a good number of teams had a build failure rate of 0%, which was great, and their build failure recovery time was zero hours. That's fine. But a majority of teams had a build failure rate of 19%, so one in five, and their build failure recovery time was four hours, so it takes them half a day to recover from a build failure. One team had a uh, build failure recovery time of 12 days, which I thought was pretty amazing. I always used to like imagining that when their build went wrong and their monitor went red, they just went on holiday for a fortnight and then came back and hoped Jenkins had kind of fixed it for them. Uh, that isn't what happened. <laughs> so um, this is a uh, stability indicator for the grapes team. Um, and we've got our build failure rate on our left y-axis, our build failure recovery time on the right y-axis. Our purple line at the bottom is our build failure rate, and that's fine, you know, they've got a low number of builds failing. But that blue line at the top, that's, uh, that's a bit strange. My maths is awful, because I only did it up to GCSE, and I'm from Cornwall, we aren't so good at numbers where I'm from. <laughs> but uh, I know enough that that blue line's a bit strange, okay, because it's not moving much. Uh, there aren't any gaps in it, so we know that measurements are happening, we know that builds are failing and being recovered. But if that's the case, why is it for six months that the failure recovery time was 10 hours? Okay, like something's badly wrong there. And um, yeah, so I kind of had a chat with their team lead, like a very careful chat with them because I was pretty sure that something was wrong. And uh, what we found was that the build lead time for this team was not zero hours. Their build lead time, including their acceptance tests, was um, 10 hours. So um, what we found was, oh, wait one sec, excuse me. There's some noise in the house. Uh, hey everyone, so Steve will be back in a minute. Sorry hey Steve. That. Just had to tell That's right. There we go. Okay, so, uh, oh, it's a good moment. Okay, so, <laughs> so 10 hours, yeah, that's very strange. Um, so it turned out that the team had um, a 10 hour build run. And the reason it didn't turn up in build lead time as 10 hours was because they were running their acceptance tests and effectively their build after they had created their release candidate. They were compiling a release candidate, putting it into the candidate repository, and then running tests on it. And that's obviously not a good thing to do 
they were doing it because they felt under pressure to get stuff done quickly. They thought they didn't have time to tackle their 10 hour um, uh, test run. And that's why we ended up with this strange graph. I remember finding it just being amazed. It never occurred to me that somebody would be that ingenious and that our measures wouldn't automatically catch that kind of scenario. Um, so we helped this team out. We found someone on a sibling team in the same delivery center who um, had a lot of experience with acceptance tests. And they sat with the team for a few weeks. And within, uh, I think it was maybe a month, we'd got it down to one hour. Uh, who would have thought that replacing a whole bunch of flaky Selenium UI tests with some unit tests would actually, an API te acceptance test, actually, you know, very quickly drag down your um, acceptance test time. Only someone who's ever worked with Selenium and people over automating stuff. All right, so our build throughput indicator. All of our teams, all 60 teams, had um, an average build lead time of zero hours. So everyone is building in under an hour. That's great. And the Grapes team was falling into this because of their um, unusual setup, shall we say. Um, but there was a huge discrepancy in terms of build interval. We had a, a handful of teams that were building every two hours. And yes, that included apples. And it did not include grapes or um, bananas. The vast majority of teams, um, they were building once every two days, right? That's not great. That's a sign that, you know, there's uh, more work that, that can be done there. Okay, so this is a build throughput indicator for the oranges team. The left y axis is hours, and it goes all the way up to 120. Uh, the yellow line here, we don't need to worry about. It's zero hours. We know that every team is building in under an hour on average. But the um, red line, the ready brown line, that's a bit strange, isn't it? So in January, this team was building uh, once every four days on Jenkins. And then in a month, they went down to once every 28 hours. Then they regressed to four days. Now, um, in my book, I call this pattern too fast, too frequent. Um, I've done continuous delivery for over a decade now. And for a team to achieve that kind of improvement in a month, one of two things is happening normally. Number one, the team has stopped all product work and they are just doing a massive reset and everyone is flooding onto the build system to make it better. Or the more likely scenario is that they're being told to crunch. Um, so we said at the start, continuous delivery is always different. I've also said you shouldn't um, try to extract stories from numbers. I do think in a, working in an organization, you can have some heuristics. And one of my heuristics is that an improvement that fast is a bit fishy, and it's probably due to some warped incentives. And what had happened here was that the team had a, de a deadline, or a sad line, effectively. Um, it had to be hit in February. So the team started building more and more frequently to churn out more release candidates for more load testing, for more production deployments. And it was beautiful because just as this build throughput was accelerating, their build stability was worsening. There were more and more builds failing. And you can see after the deadline passed, the team regressed back to where they'd previously been because that's what they were comfortable with. And that's kind of the kind of pattern that that team was uh, working in. So um, I went to have a chat with their product owner, kind of showed them the graphs. And I was like, you know, this isn't a good thing. This is kind of unhealthy. The team's not working at a sustainable pace. There will be more failures as a result of this. Um, and the product owner was really good about it. You know, they said, what can we do differently? And I think one thing we said was to try to flatten out that um, uh, peak period, to try to change the deadlines a little bit, to relax the team a little bit more. And what we found was that um, the team was able to get back to um, one build every day um, shortly after this time period. And one thing that helped was that they had done it before. Right, we could say to them, uh, remember what it was like, the advantages of building once a day. You know, they had got there, but just um, in a situation where it wasn't um, something they could retain. All right, so let me just check how we're doing for time, including the telling off. Okay, so we've got, uh, let's see, nine minutes. Okay, plenty of time. So, uh, Last type of indicator, we can apply these throughput measures to um, your commits, your mainline commits. So um, I'm a huge fan of trunk-based development. It remains a really emotive subject for a lot of people. I'm really grateful for to Dr. Forsgren for showing there's a statistically significant correlation between trunk-based development, um, continuous delivery succeeding, organizational performance, and organizations making more money. 
that definitely changes some of the sub, uh, the, top, the conversations I have. Now that's that's great. Um, however, um, asking 60 teams to do trunk-based development from the outset is a bit of a reach. So it was actually me that imposed, let's say, yeah, imposed. I imposed GitHub flow on all of our teams. And that means uh, pull requests within a 24 hour period. I did that because I wanted to eliminate Git flow, which a couple of teams were doing because they'd read on the internet and thought you just kind of had to do it. When Git flow, of course, is an abomination and utterly incompatible with continuous delivery. So we wanted to measure the lead time to a mainline commit. That is the time to merge a change from a remote branch onto mainline. And also how often changes are happening on mainline because that would give us a strong signal of if a team was practicing continuous integration or not. So continuous integration isn't a URL, it isn't a build server, it isn't a tool, um, it's a practice, it's a team practice, it's that everybody on a team is committing changes to mainline at least once a day. And that's a really, really powerful suggestion of whether a team is able to accomplish continuous delivery or not, if their code base is always releasable if they're always safely making changes on mainline together. So the numbers on this were very interesting. Um, with code throughput, we looked at your mainline commit lead time. Yep, that's a time for remote branch uh, commit to it appear, same commit appearing on mainline. And your mainline commit interval is the time in between uh, your commits. Now, uh, the vision of success here is pretty straightforward because continuous integration has a static success threshold. It says you, everyone has to change mainline at least once a day. So it's easy enough to say as a, um, as a floor of expectations, we have to have mainline commits at least once every 24 hours. And that lead time from a branch commit to arriving on mainline needs to be under an hour. So to um, our amazement, to my amazement, all of our 60 teams averaged zero hours between a commit landing on a branch to it going on to mainline, which was a suggestion that GitHub flow was in place and working well. Of course, we had some teams that moved on to trunk-based development. They took off the training wheels and they went even further, including the Apple's team I mentioned earlier, including the um, Orange's team as well, I think, in the end, and um, four or five other teams. And of course, in a, in a measurement sense, that meant that if a change went straight onto mainline, your mainline commit lead time was effectively zero. And you know you and I can be friends because you're doing trunk based development, which is awesome. But there was some really substantial variation in that, and this is one of the reasons why I'm a big believer in looking at um, average and variation. There were some really crazy spikes in terms of the amount of time that code sat on a branch before it reached mainline, and that's nicely aligned with an argument I've made for a long time around GitHub Flow that it's very easy to slide out of continuous integration not least because tools like GitHub and, GitLab, uh, GitHub and GitLab incentivize you to do the wrong thing. Their, their, their tooling is getting better and better at doing the wrong thing and pushing you away from frequent mainline commits. We had a huge difference in the average interval between mainline commits. Three or four teams were pushing changes to mainline every two hours, which is fantastic. And that's exactly what we want to see. But the vast majority of teams, they, the vast majority of teams we're averaging five days. Okay, so there's lots of improvement that we could make there. All right, last example, the pairs team. This was years ago, and I still can't look at a pair without thinking of these, these folks. Um, I've used this, I've long ago forgotten the real name of the team, but I was thinking of pairs like, Arr. so what happened with pairs was, um, they were a team kind of late onto the platform, and they popped up one day at our front door Slack channel, and we're like, hello, we can't help but notice that you can't build branches on Jenkins. And then my team are kind of giggling like, Steve, you should totally talk to these people. And I was like, yes, hello. Um, we, you can't build branches because that's incompatible with continuous integration. If you want to run your tests on Jenkins, do it on mainline. Um, and the team then, uh, I think the kids these days call it ghosted. Go I got ghosted, I think. Like they just kind of dropped off my radar completely. And I was like, oh, that's strange. They didn't hang around for a debate or a, okay, how does that happen? Just, uh, they just dropped it entirely. And, um, Months later, I think we kind of had some other weak signals that this team was getting to a spot of bother. Um, months later, I looked at the indicator. I was off doing other stuff at the time. And I saw something like this, which is kind of horrifying. So the left y-axis here is hours, and the scale is large. We're up to 750 hours here. And the x-axis is time. 
the blue line is your median mainline lead time and that's actually got an uptick there from zero hours to 28 hours so they went from merging changes from remote to mainline in under an hour to in under a day that's not great but the real kicker is the frequency of changes on mainline went from once a week to once a month and you know i phoned up the team lead and i was like hello and they were like we were wondering when you'd phone us steve we've got all these problems and i was like yes yes you know uh, um, how can we help um and this team needed a lot of help they didn't need um, derision or scorn they needed assistance with a really tricky problem where their product owner had been insisting on more features and an architect from somewhere who had somehow escaped my clutches had uh, gone to the team and said, you must implement this standard. It's super important. And the team had these two impossible um, demands upon them. They didn't feel that they were in a safe enough space to kind of surface this conflict and find a resolution jointly. So essentially they went off branching. They were building two different solutions on two different branches. The branches were named after Disney characters and they lasted for you know days, weeks, months at a time. Um, I think when you start naming your branches after Disney characters, it's time to admit you've got a bit of a problem and you should be phoning me. Um, and I'm, I'm nice, I can help. Um, and with this team, we uh, parachuted someone into the team, not literally, you're not allowed to do that in government, but we found someone in another team that was um, well-versed in feature toggles and branch by abstraction. We started to put that in place for this service and um, their commit interval started to come down. I think eventually they got back to once a week. Um, but one interesting corollary to that was that by putting in feature toggles and putting in branch by abstraction, they increased the adaptive capacity of their service. They made it possible to gracefully degrade on failure. And that happened one day, um, unknown to me, a third party endpoint that they entirely depended on just went boom, it wasn't available. And when the product owner kind of said to the team in a bit of a panic, like, what do we do? Do we shutter the service? One of the developers said, let's turn on our um, feature toggles turn on the stubs that we use in our test environments and just collect data for a while ourselves and when that third party comes back we'll do a manual reconciliation and the product owner was absolutely delighted i went around for weeks saying how their team had saved the day no need for any code no need for any massive code changes no need for any downtime and it was all because the team had started that really important shift away from branching in your version control system to branching in code and having that more modular architecture so that was a I think a good lesson to end on, I think. So in summary, uh, continuous delivery is really hard. If you don't think it is, then your um, either your name is either Dave Fowler or Jess Humble. I think it's really tough. And that's because it's so different in every organization. The tech and organizational changes that you'll need to make, they're always going to vary. And they always happen at a particular point in time in a particular context. The best weapon we have to uh, delivering continuous delivery itself is to use the improvement carter. Like, don't actually call it the carter. Don't say in your company, let's target our next condition or something. Just say, well, experiments can be run. What's our current um, progress? What's our current delivery rate? Like, what should we try next? You know, should we try trunk waste development or test driven development next? Which one do we think will help us most? Right? Once you get into that kind of mindset, once you start to measure your progress, you build up some visualizations, and you can show to people the progress that you're making. I think that's when you'll be well on your way to achieving continuous delivery. So uh, thanks for listening, and I'll hand over the questions now. Thank you very much. Oh, brilliant! Hello. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> excellent. That's even fitting that's, in the telling off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's just awesome. messaged me Thank saying sorry. There you go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, that's brilliant. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, right, so let me just, it, while I'm going to do this, if people want to have a look at the Q&A panel, if there are questions in there that you'd like to uh, vote for and sort of prioritize to say, actually, let's, let's ask Steve to, 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 to answer these first. Uh, now's your chance while I just sort out the video to go and do that. Um, I am going to move into gallery view, so you should be able to see, if you're looking at panel or gallery view, you should be able to see myself, Steve and Lindsay. Um, and we've got some questions now. So, um, uh, from I think one of our future speakers. So Ben Conrad is asking, uh, is there a risk that the teams try to game your system? Is that uh, what was driving the grape, uh, team grape? And might a team just do tiny changes to make the graphs better? And is that a good thing anyway? 
is that a good or bad thing anyway? Uh, game? That's a great question. Thank you. I totally know the answer. Yes, people will game it. And that's why the choice of measures is so important. That's why you choose um, holistic measures that are really hard to game. Okay? If people are measured on story points, then they're going to deliver more story points. If they're measured on defect count, there's going to be fewer defects reported. If you measure people on deployment throughput, on deployment frequency, they will try to do more production deployments. And yes, if they push through a few little changes, then that's fine. Okay? Uh, there's a thing called um, Goodhart's Law that basically says um, when a measure becomes a target, it stops being a useful measure. Uh, like the UK government's measure of like testing capacity for the coronavirus, it keeps mysteriously changing based on dates that people want. You know, it's, it's become a target. It's no longer a useful measure, right? So you can't fight Goodhart's law. You have to try to make the best of it and exploit it. And definitely one thing I do unashamedly with every client I work with is I try to drive people in certain directions based on incentives. And one of those is to measure them on deployment throughput, not on story points or some other silliness. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the question, Ben. Um, so we've got a uh, next question from Alex Singh. Um, how do you convince a team to not use branches and favor trunk-based development? Oh, wow. That's, uh, that could be a whole other talk that um, Dave or I or many other equal experts folks could do. Um, that's, that's really tough. I think it's, it's like any change. It's about showing people the problems that they're facing and trying to frame something as an experiment. Trunk-based development is one of those things that it's really hard to retrofit onto a code base. Like if a code base is monolithic, hard to refactor, then trunk-based development will be tougher. Like there's no getting around that. You might need to put some tests in place beforehand. I think that um, you can't be using like Steve kind of language. You can't say things like trunk-based development will optimize for the team rather than optimize for the individual because people will just look at you and go, what are you saying? <laughs> it's just about framing it in terms of the problems that people are facing. Like people might notice that sometimes pull requests go unanswered for a long time. People might notice that design conversations are quite heated because they're happening after code changes have been made. Um, I think like everything comes back to just try some experiments and give it a try. And if it doesn't work, maybe back off, reflect on it, and then try something else that's similar and just kind of nudge along towards it. Cool. All right, brilliant. Thanks for the question, Alex. Uh, thanks, Steve. And Stu, Stu Abel has got another question here. So Steve, would you classify as a deployment failure when you're in those measures? Oh, wow. That's a really good question. So um, uh, the answer back is like what you want it to be. So the way that we did it in that particular government project was um, a, when a deployment came back, when the orchestration engine said failure, when the Docker container had failed to start successfully, um, there are many other things you could look at. You could look, for example, at the incident system. You could look at something like Jira and see how many incidents are raised as tickets. But the problem with that is that Jira's APIs suck and people, re look at, people create incidents in different ways. So you want to measure deployment failures measure any of um, these techniques really in a way where the data is easy to automate, easy to collect and easy to standardize. So it's easier to make calculations on. The important thing to remember is that you're not trying to achieve certainty. You're trying to achieve, reduce uncertainty. You're not trying to make some, you're not trying to get the perfect measurement, you're trying to get good measurements. And as long as you're consistent across the board in how you measure something and you're transparent in how you do it and the limitations of it, then I think that's absolutely fine. Um, one example I can give very quickly is we look to track like deployment failure recovery time in this government department. We looked at hotfix versions. We looked at how often a hotfix was going out. Now that's not going to cover all the possible scenarios in which a failure happened, but it gave us some really useful insights because obviously um, hotfixes are not something that happens terribly often. So when it does, we can um, infer that there's been some kind of serious failure. So that kind of thing can really work as long as you're clear to people well, by using hotfixes, we're not catching this class of error, we're, but we are getting this class of error consistently and accurately. Cool. All right, brilliant. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so we're coming up to seven, so I'll just spin through a couple, like a, a last couple of questions. Um, so I think uh, there's an interesting one here from Simon Horton, which says, how long do you collect data in the old world 
to prove the flaws before you start making changes in the new world. Oh, wow. That's a good one. Now, the answer is you don't stop collecting data in the old world. You keep showing people the flaws in the old world because someone's always going to rock up and say, the old world's cheaper <laughs> or the old world's easier or the old world doesn't involve that tall guy from Equal Experts like telling me I should keep sticking to the new world. It's bound to work sooner or later. Um, I, I was interpreting that question slightly differently, Steve. So I, I wonder if Simon was um, asking, you know, do we watch a team for one week and then with one week's data we suggest some, some uh, things they might want to consider doing differently or, or do we watch them for a month or two months so how much data do we do oh, you I find see. useful to get out from a team oh okay so uh, what we did was um, we uh, we measured data for the past year and then we chunked it up to look like month by month and the data that we um, like the data that we collected from previous years, we still had that data if everyone wanted to go back and look at anything historical. We didn't delete any data, but we kept the window to a year. That just felt useful to people because it was a government department where things are very based like year to year. In another organization where perhaps they have like, I don't know, uh, two major business peaks a year, you might do that six months by six months. What about for a team that was new? So if you saw a new team come onto the platform, how long would you give them Oh, you start measuring them from day one. And then... And if, they've wait, had no, and, and if they've had no production deployments, you stick up a big fat number on their website page that says, you've had no deployments so far, and it's been 25 days since you started writing code. And that's another incentive to, you know, you need to start deploying now. They get a day, a week, a month. <laughs> <laughs> like the moment you start day, writing code, yeah. the moment you start writing code, it's... Um, start the clock on when the first production deployment is going to happen. Yeah, great. Cool. Um, all right, thanks, Simon. And then actually we are at time. So, um, and yes, I think we will we'll call it there actually because we're at time. I know people are spending a lot of time uh, on video calls at the minute. Um, everybody's uh, obviously dealing with working in a, in a different way. So. Um, I want to say thank you very much uh, to Steve for the talk. That was awesome. Really good. Thank you. Thanks um, for coming. Much appreciated. Thanks to Equal Experts as ever. Yeah, and th yeah, exactly. Thank you everybody for coming. That was, that was a great audience. Great questions. Thanks, Lindsay, for, uh, for joining just to help out. That's fantastic. Um, and just before we close, so we have um, a few more talks coming up in this series on continuous delivery. So next week, uh, 24th of June, um, Ben Conrad, who I believe was on the call today uh, from HMRC, will join us to talk about how their digital tax platform has supported the rapid launch of COVID-19 services at HMRC, oh, wow. um, which is it's going to be an amazing talk. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, 1st of July, Stuart Gunter, our security practice lead, will talk about secure continuous delivery. Um, and then... On the 8th of July, uh, Lisa Crispin is going to join us from the US to present, and she'll be talking about uh, a whole team approach to quality and continuous delivery. So loads more talks uh, coming up on, these, on this series. Um, we've now launched the Expert Talks online listings page on the Equal Experts website. So if you go to equalexperts.com, you can see all the talks that are coming up and sign up for them there. Um, all right. so. Uh, and there's a question here going, missed the last two webinars, is there a recording link? Yes, there is. Uh, all of our talks are recorded. They're published on YouTube and you can also see them now on the Equal Experts website with a history of all the talks we've had so far. So there are, there's quite a lot there. John, could you get that link pumped out on the Equal Experts Twitter tonight, perhaps? Uh, absolutely. Yes. Great call. Great shout. Thanks, Steve. Um, so thanks very much everybody for joining and we will see you next time. Take thanks it easy. Everyone. Have a good evening. Bye.